Hey, welcome in with us uh, today on our pop-up Bible study. I've got Ian King here, uh, the senior leader of Restore, as we're going to begin this whole thing, this this new podcast idea that we got going on. Thank you so much for joining me, Ian. It's a pleasure. Yeah, welcome in. Uh, so the whole idea of this is to kind of like deconstruct the Bible, and it can be confusing, right? Like, Yeah. I, I mean... Yep. Maybe, maybe this is just me, but many a time I've read the Bible and I'm like, oh, what did I even read? Yep. What was the, was this meant for me or for somebody else? I, I'm just not quite sure. And I feel like I'm not the only one yep. that's ever thought that way. Uh, so here we are today to to start this thing off. Let's, let's teach each other, if you will, as iron sharpens iron, a verse from the Bible, uh, to be better at reading the Bible. So what, what's the passage we're reading today? We're going to read um, one of my favorite passages, which is from Mark chapter 10, and it's the story when Jesus um, heals blind Bartimaeus. Okay, by Mark. Do you mind reading that No, f- that I'm very for happy us. to read it. Yeah. Um, it. It's actually quite a short passage, which was another reason for picking it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can get a lot from short passages sometimes, and sometimes reading less is better than reading a lot. Exactly. I think sometimes we don't remember what we've read because we've read mm-hmm. several chapters because that's what we feel like we ought to. Mm-hmm. Whereas actually if you read one chapter or one bit of one chapter and felt God speak to you, actually, I think that's worth a lot, lot more because it's about the the word living, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But I will read it in a minute as well. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So Mark chapter 10, uh, starting at verse 46, it says this. It says, And they came to Jericho, and as he was going out from Jericho, that's Jesus, with his disciples, and a great multitude, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, arise, he's calling for you. And casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. Okay, so let's pretend that's the first time you've ever read this, this passage here. What's your step one of you, you read these, you know, 12 sentences. What does Ian King do? What does Ian King do? Um, he probably reads it fairly carefully mm. and then he probably rereads it and maybe rereads it mm. just so that I can really um, get into the elements of what happened in the story mm. because it's easy to read something quickly and mm. not really take it in and I think in lots of ways I'm a bit of a skim reader and so one of the dangers is you read it like you're reading a novel and yeah. you don't really let it sink in and so for me and also because we're dealing with a historic situation different culture and that sort of thing yeah. I think if you can read it and then reread it mm-hmm. um, and maybe read it again mm-hmm. then it helps for the different elements it, because I think often the richness in the Bible is often in the nuances mm-hmm. and the little details and again if you just think of the big picture sometimes you miss some of the real nuggets that are there in the passage whereas if you've got time to just sit in it and I mean another alternative is to read other versions of it as well if Mm -hmm. if you read a story and think that's a great story Mm -hmm. I think there can be some value in in reading like the message which is a contemporary retelling of the story Mm -hmm. or the passion translation which is a is a more accurate literally um, to the original um, languages of the Bible, um, a, a more accurate modern translation of the Bible. Right. So you can read some other things just to give you, I guess, um, a wider picture mm. of uh, of the story. Okay, I mean, that, that, that broaches the topic of translations. What, what did you read today? I read from the New American Standard version. Okay. I, I, think, um, I think you want a version that is easy for you to read mm-hmm. and works for who you are. Mm. And I think that the best way of learning that is just to read some things with different translations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's plus and min- minuses with different <coughs> translations, um, not just in terms of the historic 
accuracy of them, um, but also the ease with which they flow. Right. So I think lots of people use the NIV because it's the most common one mm. and it has a good flow to it. And it's not a bad translation. I mean, there's other people better qualified to talk about the nuances <laughs> of, of translations than me. The reason I use the New American Standard Version is because it is a uh, historically pretty accurate version, the New King James mm. and the New American Standard version. So they're not quite as easy to read mm -hmm. as the NIV, but they bring out more of the nuances and the accuracy of it. And I'm somebody that, that is a bit studious by background. Mm. So for me, that becomes really important. Okay. So I find I get the fullness and the richness and therefore the confidence if I'm digging into something or going to share about something. Right. I get confidence that I know what I'm talking about because I've started there. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think about uh, the church I was a part of back in America. There was a group of people in the church that were like, if it's not King James Version, it's not the Bible. Yeah. They're, they would call the NIV as the nearly inspired version. <laughs> it's, if it's not, and they, we would jokingly say the Jimmy is the, the shorthand for King James. If it's not the Jimmy, it ain't it. But it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because, because most people use the new international version, I often will do my study with the new American mm. standard version. And then when I do my slides and I actually talk, I talk from the NIV. Okay. So I've done my kind of more scholarly background, mm -hmm. but then I, I, I use the NIV. And, and I'm a big believer if, if most people use the NIV, then let's build people's confidence in it. Mm -hmm. Let's knock it. Because if we knock it, and, and we just need to be aware that we're wanting to encourage people to get into the Bible. Yeah. So, so any way that we can help people do that, and because it is more readable, sometimes mm. it's good to do your scholarly work behind the scenes mm. and then try and make it more palatable for the for the listener or the, the viewer. Exactly. I I mean, for myself, I am mainly using the Holman Christian Standard yep. Bible. Um, but if I'm reading the more poetic. Yep. chapters of the Bible, I like reading the New King James Version because I feel like it captures the poetry yeah. the that the, the writer is trying to show to God that I'm writing these beautiful things as praise to God. So yeah. I kind of want it in the flowery language that poetry kind of works well in, or at least yeah. for, from my perspective. Well, what I like about the NASB um, that I use is the the link words mm -hmm. that have been put in by translators. Yeah, they like put, in the parentheses, right? They put those in italics. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you know that it's not actually there in the original Greek. Yeah. And so when you read it, you can you can drop out those words. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it changes the the meaning or it opens out the meaning. Yeah. And they're also very good at, at noting a word and giving you a literal translation, even if it isn't quite so readable. They'll yeah. kind of give you a literal translation in the margin. And again, for me, I find I get a wealth of, of understanding and riches by following through those kind of comments. Mm -hmm. But that is that is the way I'm wired. Yeah, I get that. I totally get that. So uh, back into the passage here. So we, we've got Jesus kind of doing his own thing here. Uh, one of the questions that would pop out to me the first time me reading it is Jesus being called son of David when David wasn't his pops, you know. So what, what is this meaning of son of David? And it shows up a couple of times here. It does. I, I think... In terms of understanding of the Bible, um, just to take a step back, yeah. and then I will answer your, your question. <laughs> I'm not just a politician, you know, <laughs> putting away and answering another question. I will come back to that. Um, I, I think part of what you're looking for when you read a story is whether there's any patterns mm -hmm. and whether there's a, any patterns in language. Mm -hmm. Because uh, obviously the readers, are trying, the writers are trying to make a point. Mm -hmm. And so if there's repeated phrases... Or, uh, then there's probably some significance that the writer's wanting to make in that. Right. And like this is only seven <laughs> verses, so it, it's a short passage, which is why it's a good one to dissect like this. One of the interesting things, though, is there's lots of son of references in the mm -hmm. in the passage. So it starts off and uh, and says uh, a blind man uh, named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Mm -hmm. Now in most stories, it doesn't give you somebody's name and right. say they're the son of, but in this one, it says Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. <laughs> And then when he cries out to Jesus, he cries out and calls him son of David. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of interplay. In fact, twice I think he cries out and says son of David. Mm -hmm. So in like seven verses, we've got three, four references to son of. Mm -hmm. Now, there must be some significance in that. And son of David was the title that was used for the coming Messiah okay. in the days of, of Jesus. Because one of the prophecies from the Old Testament about the Messiah mm -hmm. 
is that he would be born of the line of David. Mm. Hence, you would call that the son of David. Yeah. So when Bartimaeus is crying out, and one of the reasons the crowd got upset with him when he was crying out, is he was crying out saying, he's the saviour, he's the messiah. Mm -hmm. He wasn't just saying, here's a Jesus I've heard of, mm -hmm. or he's a healer that I've heard of. He was saying, this is the messiah, this is the messiah. Mm. But it's really interesting because you get the son of a man who meets the son of God, right. and then a son of a man is changed by the son of God. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it always happens through the gospel. Whenever mm. a, a son of man meets a son of God, it's the son of man that is always changed to something better. Yeah. And, and Bartimaeus means son of Timaeus, and, and there's, there's some dispute over what Timaeus means, because some people say it means uh, son of honor, and some people say it means unclean son. Okay. And, and, and scholars can't agree between the two. But I love the fact because in lots of ways, an unclean son meets the son of God and goes away being honoured. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's like... So it can be both. There can, you can hold both things yeah, at the same time. And, and if it, just when you start to reflect on it, you think, wow, isn't that incredible? Yeah. Um, but all the son of references is because there's, there's a rhythm kind of in the narrative, mm -hmm. which is why it's important to read it a few times and sit under it, mm -hmm. because then you notice those subtleties, but actually there's real power in those subtleties. Absolutely. I mean... I, I, the, the Timaeus bit, I feel like I'm, I'm in a classroom all of a sudden. I didn't know these things, which is great. Uh, and so the, 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 cl the, the crowd rebuking this guy, or why would they be upset with him, with him calling out to Jesus? What, what is the upset part of that? They were, well, it, this is, again, love, love, love this. Um, they were upset because he was saying this is the Jewish Messiah. Mm. And that was a, a, a very controversial thing to say. But Did, I mean, weren't the Jews hoping for their Messiah? What's the... They were hoping for their Messiah, but they were hoping for a Messiah that didn't look like the one that came. Okay. And so they didn't expect a servant. Mm -hmm. They didn't expect uh, someone that the, the poor and the outcasts right. were flocking to. They were looking for a military leader. Built uh, in crown. Yeah, who was going to mm. deliver them from Roman occupation. Gotcha. They were looking probably for somebody who looked like the Pharisees. Okay. And because that's what you would expect an important religious person to look like. And Jesus was the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And here is, here is a blind man. The, the other aspect of that, of course, as well, is that if you were blind, you, were considered, you wouldn't have been able to go to the temple yeah. because anybody that had any disability was excluded from the uh, temple. And you'd be a beggar mm -hmm. as well because there was no um, support from the government or anything like that. So often people would be despised in mm. that situation. Um, a, a, a little like um, a homeless person today mm -hmm. that, that lots of people walk by and don't take any notice of. Right. So if one of those guys suddenly stood up and started shouting, mm -hmm. and even if you had a sense that this is somebody important that I want to listen to, you, it, it's very easy to see why the crowd would say, shut up, he's not come for you. Because exactly. there was no expectation that that's who Jesus would stop for. Yeah. And again, one of the wonders of the story is that's precisely the cry that Jesus responds to. Mm -hmm. All the cries that must have been going on out of the crowd, it was precisely that. Yeah. And the other thing that's really interesting, I mean, I'm sure this is what you want. Um, <laughs> I hope this is what you want. Anyway, is the guy was blind but he had a greater insight into who Jesus was mm -hmm. than the crowd who could see. Mm -hmm. And I think that says something so significant to us that often we can think that we can see, but we can be blind. Yeah. And somebody who's blind or disadvantaged sometimes can see more than we can see. Yeah. And it's to do with, with getting something in our heart and in our spirit, isn't it? Because... Mm -hmm. What was it that enabled Bartimaeus to see? Somehow he had a revelation. This is God. And he couldn't let it go. Yeah, the no, crowd he, was telling him to shut up. He just yeah, couldn't let it go. Yeah, yeah. He knew it was his moment. Mm. And I think that's a, that's a great challenge to us, isn't it? Because another interesting thing to re reflect on, being led by the crowd is rarely a good idea. Mm -hmm. And we see that in the Bible, don't we? You know, you get Palm Sunday and all the crowds are flocking and, mm -hmm. and making a big noise about Jesus. And a couple of days later, they're all saying, crucify him, crucify, yeah. crucify him. And, and just following the crowd is rarely a good idea. Mm -hmm. And Bartimaeus was prepared to stand out from the crowd. Mm -hmm. And out because of that, he got his miracle. I mean, it's one of those things that I think when I read this, I think of... You know, there's another Bible verse, lean not on your own understanding yeah. of like all the people around 
because they had sight, they felt like they had everything understood. They know what's happening, the ins and outs. They could even predict what's about to happen. And Bartimaeus didn't. And so something, you know, I feel like the end result, we know the secret sauce is God, the spirit of God, uh, showed him something outside of his understanding and he leaned on it. He's like, oh, this is, I've got nothing else. This is what I'm going to lean on. And so for us as modern day people is all about understanding. Like I've done my research. I've looked at the websites. I've read all these books. I know, like I've listened to the experts. I know, um, believe in believer and unbeliever of like relying on that where I think there's an aspect we always have to leave ourselves open to the thing we don't fully know is, and that's the mystery and spirit of yeah. God of yeah. it will surprise us yeah. in ways it'll come in moments we don't expect it and then to lean into that in those moments and not just oh I know the the math doesn't add up here I couldn't do this and like oh no the my my budget doesn't add up. There's no way I can give an offering this week and there's no way I can tithe because my bills equal this. Well, we, when sometimes, and I'm using that as just a yeah. broad example, but we got to lean into not our own understanding. But you raise a really important point, Dustin, and particularly in terms of uh, um, how we get changed by what we read, mm. what, what we encounter of truth in the Bible. And the reality is we don't get changed by information. Mm -hmm. We get changed by revelation. Yeah. And we want to read the Bible, not just to get more information. And not that information is bad, mm -hmm. because understanding the culture, the context, what the original Greek says and all of that kind of stuff, yeah. that, that is helpful in terms of building a good framework for, for then um, being able to open up the Bible. But really, we get changed when God meets us in the Bible, which mm -hmm. is when we get revelation. Right. And when Jesus said to the disciples, who, who do people say I am? Mm -hmm. You know, they come out with Elijah, you know, some say John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And then Peter says, oh, you're the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says to him, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. In yeah. other words, it's not by man's hard work or information. But he talks about it's the spirit of God that reveals that to you. And for me... Like, if, if I was preparing a preach on this, I would be praying over it. I'd be asking God, God, what are you speaking out of it? Right. And often I find that, that, that little bits of it just open out in front of me, mm -hmm. and God speaks to me out of it. And it's that living word that makes all the difference. And, when, when, mm -hmm. and I find out when I speak then from a passage, if I just share the information, for some people that ticks their boxes and they like that because it... <laughs> Well, it, it, it's just interesting information, I think. Mm -hmm. But really, where you get moments that people really respond, they come out of the revelation and the yeah. thing that God spoke to me. Yeah. Because that is what we're wanting. We're wanting to encounter God as we read his word. Mm -hmm. And that will only come through revelation. And for Bartimaeus, he had a revelation moment, mm -hmm. which was a moment of spiritual insight. Yeah. And the crowd had their physical sight, but they didn't have their revelation moments. Exactly. Well, or maybe, maybe they did at the end. We yeah. don't know, but, but maybe they did out of the healing. Yeah. But it's that personal encounter with Jesus through the word. Mm -hmm. It's that that's life-changing. Absolutely. So if I'm, I'm, I'm kind of reading you correctly here, it sounds like anytime we read the, the word, yes, we have a lot of resources and everything, but if we don't go to God with this, yeah. it's just rote at that point. Point. Yeah. You know, I can I could say the scripture word for word back to you, but it doesn't mean I know it. You that, know, I can know it, but it doesn't mean I know it. Yeah. And and I think once God does speak to you out of a passage, it stays with you mm -hmm. like never before. So so a lot of the stuff I'll be drawing out of this passage mm -hmm. will be stuff that God's spoken to me out of it. Yeah. And it's not like I've been cramming it, reading commentaries before this, because I haven't. Yeah. And I, I looked up to remind myself the, the meaning of the word Timaeus. Other than that, I haven't looked up anything in yeah. preparation for this. But a lot of what's there in the passage is stuff that God has just spoken to me out of it, mm -hmm. that has just opened up a world of insight and understanding. But I've been changed through the process of that. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's the... The, the power of the Bible, if you yeah. will, that it is a living document still, that the words aren't really changing at all. It, it's still breathing new life into us. I always remember there's a, uh, back in America, the, whoever founded the church and retired, he's still around. He becomes the bishop. 
Uh, so the, the the bishop of the church that I went to, we called him Papa K. Like yeah. just to everybody, he was Papa K. Yeah. Um, and he would tell a story that back in the day when you could street preach, you know, before America fully fell in love with the car um, and people walked places, <laughs> he would put a Bible on the ground on the sidewalk and he'd cover it with his suit jacket and he'd start yelling like, careful, don't step on it. It's alive under there and nobody knows what's under there. And he'd form a crowd, careful, careful, something's alive under there. If you step on it, it's, it's not... It's not going to be what you want. And he, once a sufficient crowd would gather, he'd pull it back and then it'd be the Bible and he'd talk, he'd preach right oh, wow. there on the street about how this is a living thing and yeah. how now I'm, you know, he was a young man in his 20s when he started that. And he'd be like, I'm 80 something now. I'm still learning something from the same verses. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 It's great. Love it. So, uh, one of the things that I, I kind of learned a few years ago, the, the imagery that somebody used is that the Bible is a lot like a puzzle. Yep. If you if you upended the Bible and it scatters on this table and you have the thousand pieces, you can't just take one piece and look at it and like, oh, there's some blue on there. Yeah. Uh, this must be the picture of an aquarium. And then you set it down and then it's actually the blue of the sky over a meadow on a farm. And then you, so if you took the one yeah. thing, you don't really understand it. And so the Bible always interlocks with each other yeah. and so there's there's echoes if you will of what happened before happens here happens again yeah. uh so what would you say is maybe an echo moment for this story yeah i think you're right you're looking for links really mm -hmm. because like you say the bible is a is a whole book yeah that helps us have our understanding of god so if you can see connections from one point to another often there's something significant in the connections. Yeah. And this story is really interesting because it says right at the beginning it happens at Jericho. Mm -hmm. And so one of the interesting questions to ask is, oh, what's the historic significance of Jericho then? Mm -hmm. And if and most of us probably know that, Joshua in chapter 6, you know, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. But a, a couple of things that I think are really interesting with that, if, if you go back, so for me, I would then go back and read what happened at Jericho mm -hmm. and other Bible references to Jericho to see if the place has some historic significance that yeah. speaks into our understanding of this story. Yeah. And one of the interesting things in Joshua chapter 6, at the end of it, once Jericho's been destroyed, is God spoke to, to Joshua and said, um, you need to say to Israel, this city should never be rebuilt. Okay. And, and actually said that there would be a curse that would come on the person who rebuilt it, that they'd lose okay. their, their firstborn and their lastborn son. Mm. And, so, and so it... It was meant to be forever written off the face of the earth. And what, what you then find is under King Ahab and mm. Queen Jezebel, who were the, the, it says, the most wicked king and queen in the whole of the nation of, of Israel, maybe not surprisingly, mm. one of the acts of rebellion to God that happened was Jericho was rebuilt. And the guy who rebuilt it, if you read it in, in 1 Kings 16, 17, you find that, that his firstborn son died and his youngest son died, so the mm. curse was fulfilled. Now, what's interesting about that is you would have thought that would be the least likely place for the Son of God to go, mm -hmm. because everything in its history speaks of rebellion to God. Yeah. Yet, Jesus, when he was walking the earth, chose still to go there and still to perform a miracle there. Mm -hmm. And so I just love that, because that says God's willing to go mm -hmm. to the worst, most extreme place yeah. to see to glorify himself and see people drawn back to himself yeah and the other thing that's really interesting is is in jericho how did how did israel win the battle at jericho what did they do to win the battle i, I know that the the you know i wasn't in sunday school but the the you know marching around the walls yeah then at the very end they blow the horns the walls come tumbling down they blow the horn hmm. Actually, they blow the horn and they all shout. Mm -hmm. So the horn was a signal to shout. Mm -hmm. How does Bartimaeus get his miracle? He shouts out. He shouts out. Mm -hmm. And the wall of blindness comes tumbling down. Mm -hmm. So there's some wonderful connections there. Yeah. What's also good about this passage is, is immediately before it, um, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus is interacting with James and John, who it, it's their moment where they say, you know, when you come again in your glory, can we be at your right and left hand? Mm -hmm. You know, because we want the great place yeah. of greatest height. I, highest honor in that they give that answer when jesus asks them the question what do you want me to do for you mm -hmm. and then in the story of bartimaeus the very next section jesus says to bartimaeus 
what do you want me to do for you? Mm -hmm. And asks exactly the same question in two connected stories. Yeah. And in one story, Jesus gives the man what he wants. In the other story, Jesus says no to it. Mm. So there must be some contrast between the two stories in terms of what gets a yes from heaven mm. and what gets a no from heaven. Yeah. And you can draw out some distinctions. But you only get that when you think, how does this passage or this story link into the wider picture, the bigger picture? Yeah. And then from it, there's untold riches that come out of it. And it just, I feel like you're just beginning. <laughs> and I, I almost like with any Bible verse or study or anything, you're like, well, then I could go on to the natural progression. I could go to this point, then I can go to another and then another. And it's that idea of the, the Bible is living. It's not just one thing. Nobody's just their hand. Their arm, their shoulders. That's why the challenge with preachers yeah. is always to shut them up, isn't it? Because there's always more. There's always more. No, nobody at Restore, though, is like that, of course. We're always of course. Very, very brief and poignant. That's why people are speeding this up as they're playing it. <laughs> exactly. Who's playing this on 1.25, 1.5? My goodness. Um, so, so thank you for that. I, I want to point out those. Ian, the senior leader of Restore, what is all that could mean but what do you where's something that you get poured into what's something that you go to what's a what's a a talk or a book yeah. or what's something that yeah. is really blessing you right now that's very churchy talk what's blessing you right it's very now very american but, churchy talk it well, is well, i am what i am <laughs> <laughs> um a, a few things really i'm i'm reading a really good book that i'm enjoying at the moment a guy called steve addison Okay. who's an um, Australian guy. Who, uh, not American. Not Darn American. It. No, I Darn. quickly put that one in. <laughs> um, he's, he's done a lot of studies on, on movements, mm -hmm. so uh, outbreaks kind of of, of, of salvation mm -hmm. around the world and, and a move of God around the world. Mm -hmm. And he's written a new book that kind of sums up, I think, a lot of his studies, so it's a good pl starting place. Mm -hmm. And he's written a book called Acts and the Movement of God, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is really, um, it takes you through the book of Acts. It's in little bite-sized chunks, so mm -hmm. a couple of pages at a time at the most. And it takes you, it's kind of like his um, commentary interpretation of mm -hmm. the dynamic that's at fl uh, it, um, happening within the book of Acts mm -hmm. as we get the spread of the gospel mm -hmm. once Jesus goes up to heaven and the Holy Spirit's poured down. And I'm finding that really inspirational. And he peppers it with uh, real life stories from around the world okay. of how we're seeing these kind of things happen yeah, in the world yeah, today. Yeah. And I think for me, it kind of touches everything I'm kind of praying for and longing for. Mm -hmm. So I'm finding that's kind of fueling my passion. Otherwise, I, I listen to quite a lot of Bridgetown um, church teaching because I think they have a lot of insightful teaching. Um, and I think they open up the word of God really well, but they also critique um, contemporary culture. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't listened for a while, but recently I've been listening to a bit more Stephen Furtick. Okay. I love a bit of, of a bit of a shouting and a hollering. Um, <laughs> You're speaking my language here all but, of a sudden. Yeah. You're back hey! on board. <laughs> I'll get up, up off the sofa in a minute. Um, <laughs> but he has some great, I think, revelation mm -hmm. from um, particularly gospel stories and things. He's got yeah. some great teaching recently I've been looking. So anybody that... Um, kind of uh, stirs my hunger for the word yeah. and the riches of the word I yeah. love. Oh, wonderful. I know if you're listening, if you, if you start working out and get real jacked, you're listening to too much Stephen Furtick, you'll have to <laughs> lay off and go somewhere else. But I'm glad uh, you're being blessed by that. You know, hopefully some of us, we can tune in. We can pick up a copy of what was the name of the book again? Steve Addison is the author and it's Acts and the Movement of God. Acts and the Movement of God. I, I recommend everyone of us to, to grab a copy to read it. I'm to, not on commission for it either. Oh, so. yes. Not, not, this isn't a sponsored deal here. <laughs> uh, but we just want to share what's what's... I, I don't want to us. say what's blessing us today. What's feeding us. <laughs> yes, what is feeding us. I'm sorry. What is feeding us today yeah. as we go on. But uh, thank you so much for stopping by today as, as we went into this pop-up Bible study. And I hope uh, everyone at home learned a, a new tool, a new technique of how to read the Bible and to, to draw what God has out of it. Thank you for stopping by, everybody. Bye.